series, we've been talking about this idea of how do we faithfully walk forward into new seasons of our lives. Remember, the entire premise of this series is all of us have never been through the places that we are right now, meaning you're, you're blazing new trails as we speak. You've never been at this point in your life before. You've never been this close to graduation or retirement before. You never had kids at this age or grandchildren growing up before. You never faced these health issues before. You never had this part of your marriage be like this before. We're all entering into new scenarios. Even if you've been married 50 years or working the same job for decades, you've never been at this point in your life before. All of this is new territory for us. Coming out of this, you don't have to wear your mask, COVID this and that, what about this and that, all this kind of stuff? Coming out of that, we're facing a brand new reality. Here in Hawaii, tourism is kind of getting going. You know how I know? Because I see more convertible Mustangs and Jeeps than I've ever seen on the road before. That's how you know tourists are coming back, right? Japanese tourism hasn't even come back yet, but things are kind of opening up, and we want it to go back to how it was, but it'll never be how it was. Everybody knows that, right? Things will never be how it was. It's gonna be where it's going. You've never been here before. And because we've never walked through this part of our lives before, we need God to guide us forward. Somebody say amen to that. In fact, the capstone verse for this entire series, don't turn here, I'll just show you, is Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. It says, then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. And I hope that you've enjoyed the past few weeks as we've talked about this series, about how do we faithfully walk forward. If you missed any of our messages, check it out on our website or on our podcast. You can see all the things that we've talked about as we literally blaze new trails. But you know what? This series is about Joshua. In the Bible, Joshua was the next man up. He was the backup quarterback that when the starter got hurt, he stepped in. That when Moses ended his leadership, Joshua was the apprentice coming up. He, he was the Brady under Bledsoe. He was the guy coming, really kind of the next guy coming up. He, he, was, he was the young, cool guy when the old guy talks too much at announcements and is finally done. He can finally come up and preach. That's Joshua. I'm just saying, you know, just saying. Joshua was the next guy up. And as Joshua assumed the mantle of leadership, taking the people of Israel from Egypt, from the desert, into the promised land. They hadn't gotten there yet. Joshua was tasked with leading the people. Be strong and courageous. Follow me, the Lord says to Joshua, and I'll show you miracles. And he did. As you recall, this is just a review because we're finishing the series basically today and it ends on Good Friday. Follow me, God says, and I'll show you miracles. And as God parted the, the waters of the raging Jordan River, as God had the walls of Jericho fall, as we saw last Sunday, Joshua now is leading the people forward. Unfortunately, Joshua couldn't blame the problems that he faced on the previous administration, but instead, he was tasked with doing what God had asked him to do. In Joshua 7, we see the aftermath, almost like after the victory at Jericho. We cannot understate that the falling of the walls of the city of Jericho was a huge deal. It was like winning the Super Bowl. It, it was so big because if you remember last Sunday, if you were here, we had those three boys blow those trumpets very successfully, might I add. You remember that? And they blew the trumpets and they, we reenacted. We all cheered and the walls of Jericho fall. Huge victory. But after that happened, things went downhill. And let's talk about why. You see, in Joshua chapter 7, we're going to see that they faced an unexpected defeat after this huge victory. Joshua chapter 7. Don't read verse 1. Let's start in verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They wouldn't go eye out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Hey, not all the army will have to go up against I. Send two or three thousand men to take it. Don't weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of I, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Okay, if you're not really clear what's happening here, 
They had this huge victory, defeated this entire city with all these people, and they had to go take this little town afterwards. Like this really itty bitty tiny, that's like, that's like, if you're familiar with local high school football, that's like they beat Kahuku, now they gotta go play Kalani or something like that. <laughs> Bro, we get them, man, eh, send out the third string. And Kalani hung 70 on them. You know, it's like, that's what happened. They come out of Jericho, yeah! Okay, now we gotta go, we gotta go uh, defeat I. That's the next one in the, in the route. Ah, small guy, small potatoes, Manini, send out the couple guys, it's fine. And they get destroyed. It's kind of a big deal. Because at the end of getting destroyed, they, they beat Jericho, they lose to I. They were probably like, I, I, I. <laughs> I got a black eye. Okay, 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 okay. Hey. No, give me stink eye. My jokes are good, okay? <laughs> At least to me. Why did, why did they lose to, to, to little old eye? Here's why. Remember I said don't read verse 1? Okay, read verse 1. Joshua 7, verse 1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them... So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. There was a direct command that at the, at the conquest of Jericho, don't touch the stuff, don't steal, don't take the plunder, leave it. But one of the guys stole it and hid it. We'll hear, talk about this at Good Friday. The sin that infected everybody else. And because of this, from the big victory, all of a sudden it became a, a horrible defeat. Why is that? I want you to consider this. Victory is a great revealer. It shows what has been hidden in our lives. That victory, when you win, when something's going good, when things are rolling forward, when the well-oiled machine is working, victory is a great revealer. It shows what has been hidden. In fact, sometimes our greatest moments of victory can be followed up by great difficulties, if you think about it. Sometimes our highest points in our lives can be followed up with some really tough stuff. Why? Because sometimes in our wins, we overlook some of the things that have been broken prior to that point. Sometimes when we have a great victory, we forget what actually has been happening behind the scenes. Let me give you a silly example that means a lot to me. In 2015, when the Denver Broncos won Super Bowl 50, oh, I was so excited. I was so excited. I can't tell you how many t-shirts I bought that I don't wear anymore. But I have all this stuff. I was so happy. Man, all my friends are high-fiving. We were texting and doing all this stuff. It, it was an amazing Super Bowl. I'm just going to, even if you're not a football fan, just, oh, it was the best. Anyways, Von Miller comes in, strip sacks Fig Newton. It was the best. So after they win all this stuff, Peyton Manning wins the championship, not because he earned it, but he was there, and he rides off into the sunset, retires. DeMarcus Ware retires. All these things, oh, we're good. And then the wheels came off the wagon pretty hard. The Broncos have not been back to the playoffs since then, and it's been a long time. Even the Raiders made the playoffs since then. Come on, right? All these things are happening. But that victory, that big victory in the Super Bowl, revealed all these problems that were happening in the team that no one was looking at. No good backup quarterback, horrible drafting strategy, reached too high for Paxton Lynch, who's not even in the NFL anymore. I could go on and on and on and on. This victory glossed over all of the pukas, all the holes, all the issues that were happening behind the scenes. When I graduated from high school, big victory, a lot of fun, great stuff, but it glossed over all of the issues that were happening inside of me as I was looking forward to college and friends and all this, and I got into more trouble that summer because of graduation parties and bad decisions, because the victory of graduation glossed over what was actually happening in my decision making. When I graduated, when it came to college, coming home, big victory, a lot of fun, awesome. It glossed over all the insecurities that later came out in my life. What am I going to do? What, what am I going to work? Where am I going to go? And the list goes on and on. Our wedding was amazing. Kara and I got married. It was awesome. But everybody knows that the first couple of years are the hardest ones in marriage. Isn't it true? Especially the first one as you're adjusting to one another. And that big party we had and the fancy dress and the suit and all our friends and all the ono food that people brought and everything was so good. It glossed over the fact that there were some real issues that we had to work out. 
Just think about when you first had kids. Yeah, oh, this is hard. Same thing. Victories are great revealers of things that were always kind of hidden under there. And in fact, if success is a great revealer of what was always there, our deepest longings, desires, unfulfilled expectations, and insecurities, then we should consider what that looked like on Palm Sunday because that's what Jesus faced when he walks into Jerusalem. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to the New Testament, kind of towards the other side of it? We're going to be in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, go ahead and flip through. Find your way towards that side of it. If you're new to the Bible, just know that it, it is kind of intimidating at times. I know that feeling. I remember when I first started reading the Bible, nothing made sense. In fact, there's not just one John. There's like three other ones in the later half of the book. It's like, what is going on here? How come so many Johns? It's like a restroom. But anyways, uh, John, it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. John is the, is the fourth biography of, I'm sorry, Auntie Bobby, I'm sorry. The, John is the fourth biography of Jesus, and John is kind of like the cleanup hitter. Whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of tell similar stories to a degree, and there's some differences, but they're kind of similar. John kind of wraps up all the other stories that weren't included in the Synoptic Gospels. And in John chapter 12, we're going to see a story that isn't really given in other places of Scripture, but it's so important. So we'll see the tail end of it as it leads into Palm Sunday. We're going to be in John chapter 12. We're going to pick it up at verse 9. To give you some context, we're going to read about a man named Lazarus very quickly. The previous chapter, John 11, tells the entire story of Lazarus, probably one of the greatest miracles Jesus performs during his earthly ministry. Lazarus dies, and he, Jesus raises him from the dead. There's a lot in that rich story in John 11. Now, we're in John chapter 12. And whether you're at the, in the house or you're at your own house, let's take a look at John chapter 12, verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Real quick, before we get into Palm Sunday, which is the next verse, just know this. Sometimes when Jesus does a big miracle in your life, there are going to be a lot of people that are excited about it. And you have a great story you can tell people that'll build people up. But you're also going to make some enemies who don't like you talking about your faith. Who don't like talking about what God has done in your life. Who even though it's obvious that you're not who you were anymore, don't really like that happening. They want to keep you as you were. They want to think of you as you used to be. They want you to be dead, stink, and old in the tomb when God has brought new life into your life. Oh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to save that for Easter. Can you write that down, somebody? I'm going to put that for the Easter sermon. Okay. Anyways, people want to hear Lazarus and they want to see Jesus. Verse 12, John 12, 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took out palm branches and went out to meet him and they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, that these things had been done to him. My friends, here's what's happening in this section. There's this festival they're talking about, right? Right? People saw that there was a festival in verse 12. The festival is called Passover. It was probably the most important uh, celebration in Jewish history and culture at that time. Um, I don't know if we have an equivalent of that, basically, in our American uh, culture, local Western culture. It could be like the 4th of July and you're in Washington, D.C. It's a really big celebration at the place. That's kind of what it's like, Passover in Jerusalem. I mean, Hawaii doesn't really have that. Do we have that? Like, Kamehameha Day at Kamehameha Shopping Center. Like, nobody <laughs> celebrates that, right? <laughs> So there's this big party they're having, and everybody comes back to Jerusalem. And here's what's going on. He just raised Lazarus from the dead, a major miracle. And Jesus was coming in during Passover, a major holiday. And people were coming out to greet him, a major reception. And even though it's uh, April, I guess you could say Jesus was major. <laughs> All right, all right, I'll stop. No, I won't. I'm not going to stop. I, I can't stop, won't stop. All right. 
So Jesus rolls in during this festival time. And everybody's excited that they cut down palm branches and they're waving them. They're putting them on the ground. Other parts of the gospel say people took out their cloaks as a sign of respect and threw it on the ground. And they celebrated, here comes Jesus. Kind of a big deal. It, it was a king's welcome. It was a victorious general king coming into Jerusalem. They welcomed him. Can you go back to that verse real quick? Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it was written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. A couple things I want you to see about this today. Jesus doesn't roll into Jerusalem with this huge band and party. He's not, Jesus could have walked in with loud blaring music. He could have been that irritating guy in the giant SUV with the trunk that rattles because the sub is so big, it takes up the trunk and the back seat. Jesus could have played all this music and had a fanfare. One of my uh, things that I think about when I hear the opposite of what Jesus did is in that movie, um, that classic movie, Aladdin. Remember that part when Prince Ali walks into Agrabah? Right? Prince Ali, fabulous he, Ali Ababwa, strong as ten regular men, definitely. Right? And he comes in, so try your best to stay calm. Put on your Sunday show. Right? All this kind of, he's got the camels. He's got the camels. Okay, just, just me. All right. <laughs> Purple peacocks? He's got 53. <laughs> okay. I got kids, so. Uh, I was singing this before kids, just so you know. Like. <laughs> When it comes to exotic type, ma'am. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'll stop. Oh, I love that song. Okay, but Jesus, he walks in with the whole blah, 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 blah. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus walks in. He doesn't ride in. You would expect the king of Israel to ride in on a giant white stallion. You would expect him to walk in with full pomp and regalia to his hometown that he is winning back from the clutches of Satan, you would expect Jesus, knowing his full purpose, to ride in on this huge white war horse with a sword or a saber and his full, like, yes! And he rides in on a, a donkey? A, a donkey. I, I don't know when the word donkey is positive, right? Hey, you donkey. You ever said that in, in driving in traffic? Yeah? You said that, yeah? Look this donkey. <laughs> I love that sticker. If, the, if donkeys could fly, the North Shore would be an airport. That's what everybody I said about surfing and donkey. Like, we, seriously, when is donkey positive? It's positive at that part of Scripture. You see that little quote you see in your Bible where it kind of indents? It's an Old Testament quote. You see that little footnote? It takes you back to, I believe it's Zechariah. There's a prophecy why? Because Jesus didn't come in as the Taran Taran king. He came in as a servant, lowly, riding on a donkey. This is like the CEO of the Fortune 500 company rolling up to the shareholders meeting in the 98 gray Corolla. That's what, this, that's what it's like. It's like, is something wrong with the company? <laughs> like, is there a reason why Tim Cook is coming to the shareholders meeting in, in a Corolla? Like, should we sell our shares? Like, no. It's because Jesus is embodying that his kingdom is not like the world. Jesus is showing us the kind of people he wants us to be. And, and in our self-promoting, please like my photo, thirst trap kind of clickbaity world, Jesus is showing us that this kingdom that he's inaugurating, that he's bringing in, he is a king of a new kingdom. That if you're looking for prosperity and you're looking for goodness and adulation, if you're looking for the applause of the world, you're following the wrong God. Because Jesus received that on Sunday and was crucified on Friday. Because he didn't come in for the applause. He's not the good time, fun time, sunshine bear kind of God. Jesus comes in humbly, and the people weren't having it because they wanted Jesus the conqueror. Free us from the oppression. Free us from the oppression of these Romans, these occupiers. Free us from these people who are illegally taking our land. Free us from these people that are taxing us out the nose. Help us, Jesus. Did Jesus come and help them? Yes. Did he help in the way they wanted to? No. Because he had something better in mind. 
when my life fell apart and I found myself unwantingly and untimingly single again, I wanted anything to take away the loneliness that I felt when I fell asleep alone at night. Free me from this, Jesus. Bring someone into my life. Change this part because I'm so angry. I'm so, this isn't fair. Did Jesus change my life? Yes. Did he change it the way I wanted it to? Nope. Not at that time, not at that moment, not in that way. He changed it in a very different way that took a much different route than the route that I would have taken. And praise God for heavenly GPS that reroutes me to a better way of going because the path that I was heading down and my innate uh, inmost desires at that moment would have taken me towards destruction. We all want Jesus to fulfill what, we're deepest, or what our deepest longings are. Everybody wants a God that, that is uh, mirroring their deepest desires and will meet them at that primal level, if you will. But if you want God to meet your needs at this moment, you might be missing out on what God is actually trying to do. Because if you follow your own path for so long, eventually you'll end up where you've always pointed your steering wheel. And that's not always in the best places. But what if Jesus has more or better than we would have for ourselves? Palm Sunday is a reminder that while they applauded Jesus when he came in, while they celebrated him, while they quoted scripture themselves when they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus had more. The people were disappointed that Jesus wasn't this conqueror. And because of that, eventually they soured on him. And eventually they not only turned their back on him, they voted to crucify him. How about in our lives today? You see, I think we're all looking for God in places that we need the most help. That's not a bad thing. That's very human, isn't it? But some of us are looking for a handyman Jesus. Just come in and fix my problems, and when you're done, I'll send you the bill. Some of us are looking for sugar daddy Jesus. Just give me everything that I want because, you know, I deserve it, right? Others of us are looking for feel-good Jesus. Just make me feel good about myself because I don't feel that great. And again, when you're done, just close the door on your way out. I'll call you up when I need you again. It's that prayer that we pray when we're stuck in a jam and we go, oh God, please, if you get me out of this, then I'll, and we make all these bargains with God that we never hold up our end on because Jesus never came to bargain. He never came to play tit for tat and this for that. Jesus never came to do that. Jesus came to show you how loved you are just where you are. In your brokenness, in your loneliness, in your confusion, in your desperation, in areas of your life where you feel like are upside down and it's not fair, Jesus came to meet you right there. He came to bring us salvation from the things that plague us, that haunt us, that surround us in this life and in eternity. And while we're looking for these different amalgamations and caricatures of Jesus, we need to consider that sometimes we say, Jesus, take the wheel, and he does, and then we start backseat driving and telling him what to do and where to go. So, would you consider, and we're going to write this down somewhere, when we're disappointed by God, we can easily turn our backs on him. Can't we? When we find ourselves disappointed by God, when things don't work out the way we wanted them to, we can easily turn our backs on him. The people of Jerusalem did that after Palm Sunday because he wasn't who they wanted him to be. Getting into your life, perhaps. Maybe you're in a dating situation and it's not working out the way that you wanted it to. And you're saying, God, how come? And in those moments, we can turn our backs on God's plan for our lives if we stuck with him. In your marriage, it might be the same. You dreamed your whole life about this marriage and now that you're in it, it's not what you thought that it would be. And whether you're wrestling with uh, infertility or you're wrestling with the problems of children, whether, whether you're, you're praying for a long time and you're still sick or you're praying for a long time and they still don't want to be with you, whatever it is, we can feel easily disappointed when we work so hard to do well and it doesn't work out. Consider another idea. How you handle disappointment will make or break your faith going forward. How you handle disappointment will make or break your faith 
going forward. Because we'll all be disappointed. Perhaps you're sitting in a, in a season of disappointment right now. You thought it was going to be, but it's not. How you handle this disappointment can either embitter or make you more cynical, or it can build your faith to believe that even in the midst of what's not happening right, God is at work. That as the song goes, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're still working. God is still at work. He's still doing things in our lives. How you handle disappointment in your life will make or break your faith going forward. How did the people of Jerusalem handle disappointment? Not well. Not well at all. I got to say, some of us here have been in church for so long, and we've endured so much disappointment, and we've come out on the good side. That's really good. That's really good. We still believe. We still follow Christ. We still have soft hearts toward the Spirit. We still hope for the best. Can I be frank? Others of us have been in church a long time. We're still here. But because of disappointments, our hearts have grown cold to the things of God. The church has become stale religion. And, and either we come or we listen online or we still believe in God. Or, but eventually, that cold, cold heart eventually gets hard and we don't hear how God is trying to lead us forward. It's really hard for our hearts. If you remember the, uh, the message a couple weeks ago when my dad uh, cut that block of ahi, I'm not going to talk about the topic. You can look it up yourself. It's hard for our hearts to be changed by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God. It's hard for the Word of God to impact our hearts when our hearts are cold and hard. How do our hearts get so hard? A lot of times, because we haven't processed disappointment well. Disappointment with God. And if you're a young adult in this room, or if you're younger in your faith in this room, just know that these are the times, these are the years, where God is building you with a resilience inside. That if you're younger in your faith or if you're a young adult in general, this is a time when God is building your faith and to process through disappointments well. Because otherwise, we fall into the trap of faith envy when we want someone else's uh, story. We see what God has done in their life. We go, oh, I want to be like that in a negative way where we don't persevere like they did. We just expect the results, yeah? I want to encourage you. Let's handle disappointment well. Because... When we turn our backs on God, we might miss the miracles that he brings in the first place. Eventually, the people of Jerusalem turned their back on God. This whole Palm Sunday revealed what was in their heart the whole time. Just like when uh, the Israelites defeated Ai, it revealed what was in their camp the whole time. Hidden sin. This was hidden expectation. What's been hidden in your heart this whole time? Because when you turn your back on God, you might miss the miracles that he brings when you're only looking for it your way. Reminds me of a story that I've told here before, but on our honeymoon, Kara and I uh, went to Australia. And we booked this honeymoon. It was really fun. We went to Sydney in the opera house and saw kangaroos and koala bears and all this stuff. But one of the best parts is we went to the outback. Now, I'm not really familiar with the continent of Australia, but I know the outback's kind of in the middle. So we take this flight, kind of inner island style, into the, into the outback. We go camping in the outback and all these things. It was really fun. Slept under the stars. It was incredible. But one of the things I was really looking forward to was the hot air balloon ride that we were going to go in on the last day of our trip. So from the outback, we catch this bus that's about from the hotel, maybe half an hour to this open air site. We get out to this site, and I'm all excited. I'm jazzed. I'm like, yes, hot air balloon, morning, early morning, colors. I got my camera. I'm excited. This is going to be so postable. I'm going to get like 50 likes. It's going to be awesome. We get out there, and we're kind of going through the bus ride and everything. And the guy, the driver on the bus is cracking jokes the whole time. Hey, see that kangaroo? My Australian accent's horrible. Look at that kangaroo over there. Just kidding. And he's just joking the whole time, joking, joking, joking. So we're like, ah, oh, whatever. We get to the, um, the site where the hot air balloon basket is waiting. We get out of the bus. And as soon as you get out of the bus, this breeze meets us. We're like, oh, oh cool. Oh, nice day today. It's going to be nice. And we're kind of waiting around and everything. And the balloon pilot and the bus driver are talking to each other. And oh, it's taking kind of long, yeah? Can, can you guys hurry up? We're going to miss the sunset. And we see the b uh, balloon driver, pilot guy, get a, get a little uh, helium balloon. And he puts a LED light and he attaches it to the uh, string. So it's kind of blinking, and he lets the balloon go. And the balloon goes up, 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 and then goes zoom over there. We're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, all right. Let another one go. 
And the boy, he goes, and he goes, all right, guys, everybody back on the bus. We're like, ha ha, very funny, you're funny. <laughs> That's like, that, look at the kangaroo joke, he's been joking all morning. And he goes, now everybody back on the bus. We're like, no, we paid, air balloon, sunrise, Instagram, likes, come on, honeymoon, like, come on. And then he says, that balloon we let go, he said that there's a bunch of air currents going on that we don't really feel as bad down here, but it's bad up there. And trust me, you'd rather be on the bus wishing you were in the balloon than in the balloon wishing you were on the bus. <laughs> there was no fighting this one. I said, can we, can we uh, at least take pictures? And Karen and I, we like uh, National Lampoon's uh, Christmas Vacation and Summer Vacation, just those silly Chevy Chase movies. So I bought us Wally World t-shirts. Let's take a look at this picture. Now, if you know anything about National Lampoon Summer Vacation, they drive all the way to Wally World and they can't go in because it's closed. This was ultimate irony, in my opinion. It's like, you doofus, you wore the Wally World t-shirt. That's like wearing a Titanic t-shirt when you go on a dinner cruise and the whole thing sinks. Like, that's what happens, right? <laughs> Anyways, I'm like, can we at least take pictures as if we can pretend we're on the balloon? So they let us. Take a look at this. Yep. <laughs> See, you laugh at all my stink eye jokes. This is, this is what's in, yeah. Okay, take it off the wall, please. <laughs> so we're going, we're going back to the hotel on the bus, and like, <laughs> I'm not taking it well. I'm like, oh, these guys, I cannot believe like, we spent them. We got a refund. We could spend this money and the time. We could have done this or that instead. Blah, blah, blah. And Kara's like, babe, just relax. It's not a big deal. I'm like, I'm so disappointed. Like, oh, no, 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 no. A week later, we read in the news that there was a hot air balloon crash. Everybody died. And we looked at that, and I went, oh. Like, I was so disappointed in that moment. Could it be God was saving us? Yeah, obviously. I'm so glad we listened to wisdom and all, right? But I share that story with you because we all deal with disappointments in major or minor ways. Disappointment's a fact of life. But when you get disappointed with God because he's not doing what you wanted him to do, when he doesn't let you go up in the balloon that you thought that you are going to go up in, and take that metaphor and apply it to your life, whatever that looks like, in your relationships, in your work, in your health, in your family, when God doesn't allow what you wanted to, what you wanted to happen, could it be God actually going, I have something better for you? Trust me. Because the people of Jerusalem missed what Jesus was bringing. Luke 19 tells us that. Can I show you a quick little snippet video that summarizes Luke chapter 19? And if you want to turn there as the video is playing, it's Luke 19 verse 41. Go ahead and roll that video. Jerusalem, I come to you. Not ushering in war, but offering peace. You shout, Hosanna, save us. But you don't understand. Your ways are not my father's ways. I have come to save. Even though soon he will shout, crucify, I still come, offering salvation. These tears are not for me. They're not for what I must endure. I weep for you, Jerusalem. If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now, it is hidden from you. The day will come when your enemies will surround you. They will dash you to the ground. They will not leave one stone on another. Because you did not recognize me. You did not understand. You did not believe that God was with you. 
as we finish our time together this morning, in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 19, as this video just lays out in a different way, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem after coming in on Palm Sunday. His triumphal entry with palm branches and cloaks and shouts and cheers is followed up by his tears over the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants. Why? Because as we just saw in this video, and as I'll reference now in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, he approached Jerusalem and saw in the city, and he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. I think many of us are looking for peace that only Jesus can bring. But it's hidden from our eyes because we're looking for him in a different direction than the way he's actually coming. In a different way than Jesus actually brings in the humility of heart, and the mercy and the gentleness. We're looking for a triumphant savior. That's coming. But right now, Jesus comes to us lowly, humbly, meeting us right where we are. And after the next few verses about the destruction of Jerusalem, as Jesus prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem that happens in 70 AD, verses 43 and 44, the last line of this section in verse 44 at the very end says, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So can I ask you this? Do you recognize the time of God's coming to you right now? If you're longing for a savior, he's here. If you're looking for peace, he's bringing it. If you're looking for wholeness and victory, Jesus brings those things to us. But would you allow him to bring it in such a way where we're not dictating what God needs to do or who God needs to be for us to receive it? Would you allow Jesus to bring the hope that only he can bring? Because unfortunately, the people at Palm Sunday expected a certain thing, didn't get it, and crucified him. What about you? When we want a hero, Jesus comes with humility. When we want strength, Jesus comes as a servant. When we want to stay mad at that person because of what they did, Jesus brings mercy. When we want pleasure, Jesus brings purpose. Palm Sunday reveals what's in the hearts of the people. Would today reveal what's in your heart and mine? And when we are faced with the reality of that, would we bring it back to him? Would you say amen to that? Let's all stand together and close in a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me as we stand? Lord Jesus, we thank you that in the middle of victory, there's actually a revealing of what's going on in our hearts. And when you reveal to us by your spirit what's actually happening inside, we thank you that you don't run away and disgust from what's happening in the corners of our hearts. But in our weakness, in our insecurity, in our fear, in our anger, in our doubt, in our cynicism, and our disappointment, Lord Jesus, you meet us there. We thank you that on Palm Sunday, you victoriously rode into Jerusalem, knowing that the fulfillment of your purpose was at hand. But in the meantime, help us not to be like the people of Israel after Jericho. Help us not to be like the people of Jerusalem who had peace in their midst but missed it because they didn't recognize the coming of God. Right now, Lord Jesus, we recognize that you are here. And on Palm Sunday, we welcome you in just as much as Jerusalem welcomed you in. But this time, God, we welcome you in with hearts that are open and expectant for what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, that your plan is better than ours. Thank you, Lord, that in our disappointment, you meet us more than halfway and ask us to trust you and put our hope in you. We do that right now. Church, if there's anything in your heart where you've been disappointed by God or by someone, a frustration that's been kind of hanging over your head, take this moment right now in response. Give it to the Lord.
God, we are honest with you and with ourselves. Show us our need for you. And at the beginning of Holy Week, Lord, as you walk into Jerusalem, would you walk into our hearts? And as we celebrate Good Friday and Easter Sunday coming up, we take this time now to crown you as king in the way that you would want it to be done. Reign over our lives, reign over our hearts. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen. amen. Let's thank the Lord this morning.